Uh, how about a warm welcome for Kenny Werner.
and gentlemen, still director of jazz studies. <laughs> but he also uh, pushes the button on the, <coughs> on the recorder. That's his first job. Second job, he's director of jazz studies at, the, at NYU. <laughs> um, any questions? Since this is a clinic, I like to start there if you have a question, and then it often gets the same, same information. Anybody have a question? Yes. Well, I try to get there. He said, how do you, I, I've never been accused of playing crisp and cleanly. <laughs> of all things, that seems to be the, the least thing I can do. But this is a very easy piano to play. That's the short answer. I like that everybody sounds better on this piano. Um, the other answer is, he said, you seem to be melting into the keyboard. The, in order for something to melt, two forces must yield something. And the piano is not one of them. So in this case, one force must yield something. And this is kind of what we'll probably talk about today a little bit. I yield uh, to the piano. There's always a reason to be nervous. There's always a reason to have an idea of what you want to play and have an idea of the effect it should have and how people should view it. The problem is, when you have an idea of what you want to do, it often gets in the way of what wants to happen. You understand what I mean? Um, so I'm very much a what wants to happen type person. And the only way I can find out what wants to happen is to not try to make anything happen. Now this is not easy to do, especially when you're playing solo. You sit down solo, I can absorb myself if I'm playing with a trio. I can absorb myself with the uh, looking at the drummer, especially the drummer in my trio. He's fun to look at because he's crazy. So he's just watching. His it was really hard. I used to play in the Mel Lewis Orchestra for 10 years. It was hard to look at the drummer. That's exactly what you do at the Village Vanguard. The piano's facing the back, and Mel Lewis would be sitting there like, you know, this is for three hours. Like, <laughs> But you know what? The hands would be here. But if you watched him, it was very hard to stay awake. <laughs> but if you listened to him, of course, it was, it was incredible. And he's a good example, too. You talk about melting. He would really look like that, like a little Buddha sitting on the, on, the drum, on the drum seat. But the hands were in perfect balance. I think that might be the word. Balance. The way you find balance is by not asserting yourself. And then the balance sort of comes. And what I mean by that is if I sit down without an agenda, then the notes start to organize themselves. For example, I did not know I was going to play uh, Dolphin Dance. I had no idea. I said, this is such a good piano that I'll let it play. And what I mean by that is I start playing notes, and then I enjoy. Now, how do I melt into the situation? This is a sort of a psychological trick, but it also is a spiritual practice. The way you melt into the sound of the instrument is by loving the sound that comes out. Now, you see, this can't be conditional, because otherwise there will always be a reason why you can't do it. Well, the piano's not good, or the drummer's playing too loud, or the sound system's not good, or they didn't tune the piano, or there's not enough money on the gig, or the people are talking, or, this, or the cash register is, is cr clinging. Or, you know, there's always a reason why you can't love the sound. There's always a reason why you can't love the gig. There's always a reason why you can't love a moment in your life. And it's always a good reason. If I say, what, what's wrong with you right now? Uh, you know, and you say, well, this is going on in my life, and that's going on in my life. But it's not going on at this moment. At this moment, you're sitting in a jazz club in New York City with nothing more important to do than come and listen to a clinic on whatever this is, you know? I mean, you're not in any stressed part of the world, for example, you know? But we're not, we're rarely that objective with us. You know, I, I can't say, you know, um, I'm, I'm okay because there's great strife going on around the world, but it's not going on in my life right now, therefore I feel fine. I can't do that. I'm subjective. There are things bothering me all the time. You know? Um, maybe we should get into some of the things that bother me. <laughs> no. no, We're not going to go there yet unless the mouth m starts moving in that direction and then you, you yield. You yield to what wants to be said. And that's what, I, that's what I do. So I don't really start with a plan. 
I yield to what wants to come out. So I vow and I practice loving the sound before it comes out. And that means any sound. Now, on this piano, it's not going to be a good demonstration because it's a great piano, so any sound does sound good. But, you know, like... like I love that sound. Do you like that sound? And normally, you wouldn't consider that sound. And certainly, if you were a musician, you wouldn't play that sound. And if you did play that sound your mind would be spinning through uh, intellectual references to what that sound is. Oh, you know, uh, 20th century uh, 12-tone music. John Cage died for our sins. <laughs> Stockhausen, Schoenberg. You know, these names, wouldn't these words be waffling through your brain if you just did this? But see, that I, tr I practice not letting that happen. What I do is I hear the sound, I go, ah, ah. Every sound is like a salve, or every sound is like warm water beating on your back in a shower, you know? Or every sound is like your third glass of champagne, or chocolate-covered strawberries. Or those of you that read my book and used the CD, chocolate cake. I mean, you wouldn't normally consider that sound, or you, you would consider it in, the, in, in a reference, right? But what if you went into your kitchen and you kicked your refrigerator. You just kicked your refrigerator and it went like this. Well, then you would consider that sound very differently. You would think, wow, that's such an amazing sound. You know, you'd be sitting in your little kitchen calling your friends and say, man, you got to come over and hear this refrigerator. you got to hear my refrigerator. It's unbelievable. The sound is un incredible. Because you don't expect that sound there. So I try to practice... It's a mental practice of, of not expecting what I hear, but really cherishing what I hear. And you can do that. There are exercises that were in, in my book, you know, about um, playing notes in any succession. And that's what I was doing when I started my improvisation. I just started to play notes, and then I played any other notes that wanted to be played afterwards. How do I know they wanted to be played? Because I've practiced staying out of the way for so many years that I have, I'm probably crazy. I probably think that somebody or something is forming these notes for me, and they're just using my fingers to do it. But you know, there's nothing wrong with being crazy if the way you're crazy makes you more effective, you know? And so I am more effective when I think, wow, who's playing this? Who's doing that? And by the way, do you notice how every note is perfect? I mean, you could have written this, right? And then you would say, oh, 12-tone allegoric piece, so, you, know, you know. But it's being played by itself in a sense. Now, we can get into sort of uh, some very amateur science as to why I can do this and I can talk to you and I'm not even paying attention to what note's being played. I mean, I think it has to do with the fact that the actual dropping of fingers does not take a lot of brain power. Probably there is a, um, you know, all right, now here we go. Uh, this is uh, Hunts Hall's class of science here. Um, probably as a part of the brain that shoots neutrons, no, neurons, down to the arm and tells the fingers, drop, you know? So playing is no harder than that. It's no more difficult than that. So why do we get so wrapped up in it? Because, and this is the one sense that I am a Republican. I believe in allowing the local the local um, part or, you know, do the job without the help of the federal government. I mean, I actually don't know if I believe that in, in government, but it sure works in the body. For example, if I don't send the messages to play the piano from my, from the central government, then it's just pure action. And you notice how every note has felt really good? Because there's another principle that would really mess up basically society's conception of music. Because right now music is about as uh, separate into different categories as, uh, as medicine, you know? 
I mean, if, if a mother wants to go to a same doctor as a child, you can't do it because there's one doctor for the mother and one doctor for the child. Well, music is very segregated like that too. So much so that it has to be meaningless. Basically, music is the flow of notes. And wherever the central government of the brain doesn't try to control it, it's perfect. It's led me to believe this sort of sutra or truth. Music is already there, and it's already perfect. It's humans that screw it up. See, this could go on forever, and I'm, I'm not really aware of it because there's just a direct link between my brain that sends the message to drop fingers and the fingers, and they're dropping. And since they're dropping without the pressure and the corruption of the federal government between my ears, so to speak. Now, what, are, what is that corruption? Well, you know, in like any good federal government, there's several departments. There's the department of ego, and within it, some... Uh, some very corrupt committees. There's the committee to sound good. There's a committee to uh, seek self-esteem. There's the committee to be admired. That's a very powerful committee in the brain, to want to be admired by people. There's a committee to want to be rich and famous, to want to be, um, you know, basically, they all full the same. But when you run the, the message of play the piano through those, those departments, it's like a bill that gets out of Congress in a way, you know. It never resembles the message that went in because it's filtered through all these desires to sound good. Now I can't talk because I stopped playing. Now I have, to, I have to switch and tell my brain, talk. Um, why do we want to sound good? Um, sometimes you give them the reason, well, because music is a very you know, a fantastic institution, and we have a responsibility. If it's jazz, you know, we have a responsibility to Duke Ellington, you know, which, you know, the, you know, could be, you could think it's that. But in most cases, the reason we need to sound good is simply vanity. Meaning, you notice that the respect that is accorded people who sound good, and you want to be one of those. Now, there's really nothing wrong with that. We all sort of judge ourselves by what we do instead of what we are, which is, I believe, a, in essence, a spiritual malady. In other words, if we all loved ourselves unconditionally like we love these notes unconditionally, right? Oh, that's better. <laughs> no. um, then we wouldn't need the... Uh, the, uh, us, the uh, I can't think of the word I'm thinking of. You know... Um, the whatever, of, um, of sounding good. We wouldn't need to sound good in order to feel good about ourselves. But we often, the affirmation, thank you, that'll work. That's a nice 80s word. The affirmation of, uh, of needing to sound good, uh, from people of needing to sound good because we would already be satisfied with ourselves. So since we seek that attention or that, that sense of self from how we play, the pressure is on to sound good. Now, is that a bad thing? It's not a bad thing from a right or wrong perspective. In other words, it's not bad to admit to yourself, yeah, I want to be liked, I want to be respected. I want people to think I'm a bad MF, right? I mean, what musician doesn't actually want that, no matter how much they disguise it? The problem with it is that it actually keeps you from sounding good. This is what the premise of my, of my book was about. Um, for those of you musicians, think about a time when you really, really felt like you needed to sound good. How did you sound? How did you play? You know, any musician can answer. I see smiles. Sometimes I hear laughter. I ask that question all over the world. When you really, really need to play good, how did you play? Usually, that wasn't as good as the Tuesday before you were in a practice room all alone and burning, right? They say, wait, I just can't wait to get to Saturday to the concert. Wait till they hear this. And suddenly, the piano feels like, instead of warm water, it feels like ice. You know? And suddenly, you can't play as well as you were able to play when there was no pressure on the performance. And then think about a time you played where you didn't really care. Either you were fooling around with friends who trusted you and who you trusted, 
And you, or maybe you were laughing a lot. Or maybe you had a beer or two. I mean, this has been the attraction of drugs and alcohol to the arts ever since its inception because it just relaxes that front pressure to be good, be good, you know? But for whatever reason, you weren't caring and you played. How did you play then? Isn't that usually your better performance? Does everybody more or less agree with that? And that could be anything, golf, you know, um, anything you do, you know? I mean, did anybody ever hear shoot darts? You know, do you ever notice it like there's that one time you throw the dart, and a split second before you throw the dart, you can tell this is going to be a bullseye. You don't even have time to notice it, but you just can feel it a split second before, and boom, it is a bullseye. So how's the next dart after that, usually? So now you try to recreate the situation. You go like, now you go a little more like that. <laughs> and it's heading right for the bullseye, but it always falls short and hits the wall at the base of the wall because you got a little too precious with the second dart. Why? Because you wanted to recreate the perfection of the previous dart. And yet the perfection of the previous dart happened because you weren't thinking. So if we all accept that premise, it would seem that the goal in music is to play and not be thinking and not be trying, in a sense, not be caring. I played last night at Alice Tully Hall and um, with uh, Toots Dillman and uh, Ayerto and Oscar Castanavis. And it's funny, whoever thought to themselves, I'm playing at Lincoln Center, they got tense. And whoever thought to themselves, you know, well, this is another gig, well, I, I go on five minutes. And, and it's almost better not to know where you are. <laughs> it really is better not to make any distinction from one gig to another. Because you show up, and you put the hands down, you trust them, you help them along by loving everything they played, like I said before. And we'll get to, there's an obvious question with that that I'll answer before anyone asks it. Um, and then you leave, you know? I love to leave a gig and walk right out the back door and like go window shopping, like the gig never happened. The more I do that, the higher the performances get. The less I respect the circumstances. It's really funny, you know, because we all have respect for music and the institution of music. And yet, that respect will be the reason I can't reach my highest performance. Can any, does anybody else uh, identify with that? <coughs> OK. For the cameras, uh, everybody was shaking their head furiously. You just couldn't see them. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really strange. And in a way, that's what jazz has suffered from for quite a while. It's so, um, it's so respectful of the institution of jazz that it doesn't have any or little of the danger that jazz used to have. I like to say, and I don't want to go off too much into this, that I, I got into jazz in 1969 and 70 because everybody that played it was so outside the box of society. They were so interesting. And now I feel like jazz is the box. And the only way to play anything that feels, I have to get outside of that in order to play anything real. And that's when, when everybody has too much respect for the form. You know, here's, a, here's a, a real weird paradox in jazz. We have such respect for the original creators of it that we don't feel that we possess that same seed of creativity. And I must say, the media certainly supports that notion that nothing new could really happen. The best thing you could do is do a tribute to Thelonious Monk. You know, that's the best way you could invest your talents doing a tribute to another. Yet I never saw Thelonious Monk do a tribute. I always like to say about Thelonious Monk that he could never win the Thelonious Monk competition. <laughs> no question about it. He sounds too much like Thelonious Monk. <laughs> now I know why we got into this. It was good for fundraising. It's obvious why, the way we got into this thing about jazz and just honoring it as an institution, I mean, it must be the same thing with religion. And please don't shoot me for that, but it, it must be the same thing with religion. You know, there's just a feeling amongst everybody until we externalize it, make an institution, and then we worship the institution, then we don't realize that the way the institution started was with beings who did not worship institutions. That's how it started. 
It always started with somebody who was suffocating from the previous institution. And so what do we do? First, we follow that being. And then it happens uh, innocently enough. We follow that being. Next thing you know, someone says, what did he say? I say, well, he said this. And next thing you know, you're trying to explain what he said. And after a while, you're trying to set down some guidelines to achieve what he talked about. And next thing you know, those guidelines become rules, you know? And then a few generations or hundreds, a few uh, uh, centuries past the existence of this thing. I mean, that's what happened to classical music. That's what happened to classical music. It died. Uh, an int you know, it, uh, as, as the body of intellectual descriptions and study of it grew, the actual experience of the music diminished. And that's happening to jazz, too. It starts as trying to, you know, the, the first time I ever heard of jazz externalized was this, the statement, jazz, America's original art form. Only original. And I agree with that. And that was a great idea because then the fundraising could begin. You know, religions start as all music and then they decay to speeches and finally, the last stage is it's all fundraising. That's the last stage of a religion. <laughs> now nothing is sung or spoken without the number at the bottom of the screen. So, you know, then the question is why does anything need to be funded? It needs to be funded when it becomes irrelevant to the society. And why does it become irrelevant to society? Because people get more jacked up about trying to play jazz than playing their heart, or playing their genitals, or playing their crown chakra, which is all the great, and the funny thing is this history that oppresses everybody is made up of people who were not oppressed by history. You understand? People who had the audacity to say, this, when I hit this instrument, that's the first time this instrument has ever been played in the history of the world. It's much better to think that, untrue though it may be. There's nothing wrong with subjective thinking or even fooling yourself. If you fool yourself into becoming a stronger presence, it's okay. Don't test it for objective truth because the things you presently believe are not objective either. For example, if you think to yourself, I suck, that is not objective, that is subjective. You know, if you think to yourself, jazz is so difficult, I could never play this. This is subjective, an illusion, complete illusion. So you might as well think jazz is so easy, anybody could play it. You know, if you're going to grasp onto something subjective, it should be unrealistically positive, not unrealistically negative, because it might take you a little further. So anyway, I was not interested in supporting an institution. When I came into this music, I was looking at Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman. In fact, my book starts off with all these names. Ornette Coleman, I don't remember the order, but Ornette Coleman, Thelonious Monk, Duke Ellington, uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter. Yeah. What do all these people have in common? They were all innovators. Therefore, the real tradition of jazz is innovation. You know. And that's why I was attracted to it, because I'm a very philosophical kind of soul. I've always been interested in, you know, what's behind all this, you know? And it seemed to me that all those musicians were very cosmically, cosmocentric, if that's a word. Write it down, it'll be the name of the next album, <laughs> which we now pay for ourselves, practically, such as the state of recording business, but anyway. so. Um, uh, you know, they were very centered in that. They were not centered in the identity of the music itself. See, the music is not the shrine. The music is not the creator. The music is not even the message. The music is the messenger. There are ideas, thoughts, vibrations, whatever you want to call them, wisdom, coming from somewhere that governs all of us. And when a human yields, you see, I'm still answering his question. That's why I ask for questions. I usually only take one, though. Because <laughs> the answer is so long, either we're done or you wouldn't dare ask another because, you know, you don't want to be late for dinner. You know, when a human yields, oddly enough, they take on the strength 
of this mightier force, if you want to call that force God or the universe or the grand wazoo or whatever. I mean, whatever you want to call it, if you have new age names for it or religious names for it, but it's a space within all of us where greatness lurks. We all have this greatness, but you can't get there willfully. You sort of have to surrender, and then this thing takes over. And this is the way it works when people find uncommon courage in battle or uncommon clarity in the middle of playing for 10,000 people. When their performances rise, or the sports figure, when their performances rise, more often they will tell you that they didn't grab the reins harder, but they let go, and they felt something within them take over. History is just filled with those kind of stories. Really, the better part of our nature, the higher part of ourselves, is accessed through surrender, not through trying to take control. Which is why you can't play music from this part of your brain, or let's say the left side of your brain, the side that knows how to get to the gig, the side that drives, the side that knows what you did with your keys, the side that gets paid, writes the checks, and cashes the checks. But that's not the side of you that should be playing. You should not be calculating what your performance is about, whether sociologically or stylistically or, you know. It's better not to know where you are when you perform. And I try to, I pride myself on never knowing where I am. But uh, that's what allows the performance to come through. So I melt into this instrument by yielding to this instrument, by loving. If I hear a sound, I go, and this was, there was an exercise in my book, as soon as I hear a sound, that's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. I jam the frequencies that might say, oh, what was that sound? Well, can you use that? Well, that's not part of any tune. Or now you're playing some avant-garde stuff or, you know, whatever would identify and therefore take away all the joy because I would identify what I did. I just go, hmm. That's the most beautiful sound I ever heard. And before I know it, I have merged with my circumstances. This has a lot of implications beyond music, you know? Do you fight where you are or do you merge with your circumstances and therefore become as powerful to change them if that's what you want to do? But by railing against those circumstances, those circumstances remain. And I'm sure you have stories where you just let go and then things changed. You know? I mean, everybody has one story like that. I, I routinely let go when I play. I'm not better than any of you at letting go in my life, but I, I'm really good at letting go when I play so that I can accept what wants to happen. That makes my performance a little unpredictable because I can't even predict it. So I do the same thing in my writing. I, I had recently a gig with the Brussels Jazz Orchestra, which is a, a new CD I have out. If you're a private detective, you might be able to find it. Do you have a private detective's license, sir? Okay. No, actually, I was told I never go into a, I never go into a record store anymore because I don't want to be pissed off. But, but, uh, but I've been told it's prominently featured. So, uh, it's called Naked in the Cosmos, in fact. But so we were playing downtown, and this uh, writer said to me, you know, we heard one of these pieces. He said, "What was your plan on that piece?" And I said, "I'm sorry, I don't have a plan." See, because I would not want to restrain where the music might want to go. My plan is what will make the piece predictable. Because that plan comes from that side of my brain. That, that plan has a goal to sound good. I want all of you to like the music. And what I'll do to fulfill that plan will make the music less uh, exciting, will make it more predictable. So I start with something, and I see, where does this want to go? And before I know it, I've written a whole thing. Sometimes the premise of the piece occurs to me in the middle of the process somewhere. It's really funny. I'm writing stuff, I'm writing stuff. And oh. Wouldn't it be kinky if this became a blues after all that, you know? Or this is a samba. So I try to make those decisions later because then it's filled with so much surprising stuff. Now, this is not an employment master class, meaning you probably won't be that, you know, this is not the way to get hired in music, okay? This is the way to have a voice. This is the way to have a spiritual connection between you and your music so that if you're not hired, you can withstand it with some dignity. I mean, I went through a lot of years where nobody hired me, and the only thing that kept me going was how good it felt to play and to write and that it was mine and that it just came out of me and that it wasn't trying to fulfill anyone else's 
And you will do better faster, I think, if you can write genres and styles. And when you play with a Latin band, you play good, you play a good clave. And when you play with a bebop band, you know how to swing, whatever that means. Although, you know, I must say that uh, if you're playing and the question occurs to you, am I swinging, then you already have your answer. You know, and then when you play in a fusion band, you know how to sound like whoever. You know, uh, that's probably better for business, but there is a spiritual uh, benefit in playing music. That, I mean, there's probably a few other things on the planet that that feel that good, but the spiritual benefit is that when you let go and you imagine something's playing through you, it's like you're serving this deity that resides in your body, in your mind, in your soul. And you're, what you're doing is you're allowing him or her to play. Now, that's not your only responsibility. What we do on the other side, what we do with the left side of our brain is we practice. And that's where we do all the opposite. That's what effortless mastery is about, really. Really splitting up, you know, going with the left side of your brain for a specific set of tasks and the right side of your brain for a specific set of tasks. Performance is the right side or the creative side of your brain. Practice is the left side of your brain. In other words, in performance, you never criticize yourself because that will inhibit the performance, which will give you more to criticize. So there's the downward spiral. But in practice, all you do is look for weaknesses. What's the sense of sitting in a room by yourself practicing and just playing for hours? You're not going to learn, you're not, you're not going to play anything different when you play in real time. Now you could do that if you feel like doing it and enjoy it, but that is playing, it's not practicing. Practicing is the careful study of that which you can't do, that with your, which you're not familiar with, that which you don't have control over. So I want to gain in my practicing, increase control over the rhythms. Increase control over harmony. Increase control over melody or lines. And that is a lifelong thing. It's my hobby. And it's very nice. I've elevated it from an art to a hobby. It used to be part of my art. I've elevated it. It's now a hobby. The reason I say that is because you always have a much more pure intent with your hobby than you do in your practice. Because your practicing is always pressured by this need to sound good. So therefore, you don't practice. You may practice for 10 minutes, and then you're just playing a tune. Now that's fine, you're just playing a tune, but you're not now addressing anything that needs work. Because when you just play a tune, all you can play is what you already know how to play. It would be much better to take bars 16 and 17, which you never play well, and find 10 ways of playing on that. And that's practicing. But playing chorus after chorus is not practicing, it is playing. That's why some of you practice by just playing in real time, but you notice you're not getting any better. In fact, there's even a negative practicing. If you're the type of person that always speeds up, and you sit in the practice room for an hour, and you're playing, what are you practicing? Speeding up. You're practicing having bad time. You're practicing, if you can't play the second half of the bridge to uh, all the things you are, because it's 2-5-1 and E, which is not a very good key for saxophone players or piano players. Guitar players love E, but they don't usually play 2-5-1 in E. They play E over E. So, but, uh, but most of us, that's an uncomfortable key because we're not familiar with it. So if you play all the things you are over and over again, you're still gonna suck on the second half of the bridge. Nothing's gonna change. But if you go in for the same amount of time and practice finding those notes that you always miss and then practice them, several ways of going through it, you get better. You get better in two ways. Finally, that part of the song gets better, but then when you go back to what's familiar, you play that on a higher level. Whenever you go into unfamiliar territory, when you come back, the familiar feels even more familiar, so you soar higher. Because levels of playing are not about good or better, they're about easy or easier. Okay, the difference in the way people play is dependent on how easy it is for one to play versus another. For example, if rhythm is a problem for you, then every song you play is an adventure. And the adventure not, is not of your choosing. The adventure is, will I lose the time? Will I speed up? Will I be rhythmic? Because rhythm is difficult for me. And another guy is effortlessly rhythmic. That's why he's better. 
you know? In a, in, a, in a baseball season, the batter will have an average at the end of the year, but it's really, you know, high and low. It, it gets the average at the end of the year. But there'll be a period where he's like, um, you know, 10 for the last 100 at bats. That's a bat, batting average of 100, which those of you that don't, don't know baseball, that is exceedingly low. But it's just a snapshot in the season. Only 10 hits and 100 uh, times at bat. And when you talk to him, you say, it's really difficult right now. The ball's coming in looking like a pea. And when I guess what he's going to throw, I always guess wrong. And it's extremely difficult. Then another part of the season, he's 25 for his last 50. Now he's batting 500 for that, over that stretch. And if you talk to him, he says, the ball looks like a beach ball. It feels so easy. I get up there and I just swing the bat and I'm, and I'm right where the ball. In other words, he can define within his own ability a great difference in level by how easy or difficult it has become. So the idea in music is to make rhythm, harmony, and melody as easy as you can through practice. Practice different rhythms that give you trouble against a metronome or however you want to measure it. Until they become easy, you grow on the nutrients of each one of those practices. And then you go back to play at the jam session, you go, I'm just doing what I could do without trying any harder, but so much more is coming out. So you see, the practicing feeds the technique of the performance, but you never put the two together. And I like to think of it uh, in this way. There's a, a deity in me, there's a genius, there's a master player in me who wants to give this music to the enlightenment and the benefit of the world. And this deity is always inspired to the max always on the ultimate level of inspiration. I may suffer from highs and lows, but this thing with inside me, it's always on a level of ex ecstasy, always on a level of, of great joy, and always great compassion, always wants to give. So I want to let that part of me play, because he's always so much more ready than I am. But I support that by learning rhythms, harmonies, and melodies. So I actually roll out the carpet for this deity, sort of an act of worship, like an act of worship. I practice like a monk reads the scriptures. He doesn't read them because he hasn't read them before. He reads them because he's trying to be a vessel for a message. So in 4.4, I can be a vessel for the message. I'll give you an example of what a lack of training does to that deity. We're in 4.4, and let's say you're so comfortable in 4.4 that you can recite the rosary, or you can chant a mantra, or you can think about your guru, or you can think about Charlie Parker, or you can say Om, or you can just think sexual thoughts. You know, there's no morality in music, but the better players at least can put their mind on something else while they play. So the question is, you put your mind on your God or on the, on the miniskirt in the first row, or it doesn't really matter. The reason they're so good is because they can do that and the hands keep playing and they play in a great way. That is the higher level of playing. The hands play. The mind can be absorbed in anything, you know? So now, let's say you're chanting a mantra and the 4-4 four four is going by, and then suddenly the tune goes in the 5-4, and then, whoops, God is dead. <laughs> he dead. God is dead at that moment, isn't he? There is no God in 5-4, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Because if you start to think your mantra, you will lose the time. Because you haven't practiced 5-4. See what I mean? So this inspiring presence in you cannot come out on any forms that you're not comfortable with, that you're not masterful of. So your job as the monk in this ministry, or whatever it is, is to train yourself on increasingly forms, rhythms, harmonies, tempos, lines, and you never stop. It's a hobby, you know? You never stop a hobby. If you built model cars, you say, wow, we're really getting somewhere here with these model cars. You're not getting anywhere. You finish that one, you know, it's like brushing your teeth. Practicing is like brushing your teeth. You don't do it in the morning and go, wow, man, I'm really approaching mastery here. You know, you don't, n no matter how white they are that morning, you know you're gonna have to do it again that night or the next morning, depending on, you know, how funky you are. <laughs> Doesn't matter how good you do it today. Well, that is the kind of even temper you apply to practicing. 
You pick things you don't know and you eradicate. I think of it as removing ignorance. I keep removing things that I don't know, replacing it with knowing that thing very well. Then I just play. I just trust. And I help that along by loving every sound that comes out. Maybe it's time to play another tune. Another question? <laughs> Any questions? How are we doing? Anybody else have a question? Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, I understand uh, really you have freedom to solo, but uh, I had a chance to recently went to pray with someone like two Simmons, whatever. With who? Two, two, two Simmons. Oh, with two, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you take care of? Both? What do you uh, take care about most of the things to pray with someone who you uh, respect more? Play with someone? Yeah, like some, um, whatever band. Like, you know, I train myself. 
if I can play harmony, melody, and rhythm, then when I play with Toots Thielman, I'll have it ready to go. Harmony, melody, and rhythm. He's about melody. And the thing is, I don't, you know, it's funny because people think I play a lot of styles. I don't. I just heard a lot of styles. But I, it's not that it's bad to study styles. It's that at the time of playing, it's a sacred moment. At that moment, all that stuff drops away. However, I have a lot in the tank. So with Toot Steelman, it's about harmony and melody. So I've got two storage tanks of harmony and melody. So we don't have to drill in Alaska. I've got them right over here. And I don't get my harmony and melody from the Middle East. So, you know, you know, so I, I have that in reserve. When I hear him, I'm not trying to play what Toot Steelman would like. I'm listening to Toot Steelman, and this is what my hands play. So it's interesting. If you let go, not only does this deity take care, I mean, play well, but it, it takes care of you. I once heard in a place where I, I go to meditate, and I do recommend meditation, but I'm not a spokesperson for it. But I mean, when I want to control, this, I found myself progressively able to put my mind somewhere else, and meditation was a very key thing. And when I was at this place, they said something would happen, like uh, what they call the Shakti. This energy would come up in you, but not to worry, because all this energy wants for you is the, what's best for you. And the energy will shape itself in whatever way you need that day. So let's say you're sitting there meditating, and you come out, and you're like this, you know. Shakti's not going to let you come out like that if you're going to drive home. You're going to come out really ready to drive well. So I trust this, let's use the word, Shakti, to play the music. I don't think it'll put me somewhere weird, although because I don't try to play a certain way, many surprises still happen within that context. So that's how I play. I do play correctly in a way that will make Twitch Steelman play feel good, or Joe Lovano when I play with him, it's different. I don't try to play differently with Joe Lovano. What I do is now I'm listening to Joe Lovano. And I must say in my earlier years, I did a lot of free jazz. And what happens in free jazz is you don't have the, con free jazz is a very good thing to do, by the way. Not free jazz, free music. Because there are no wrong notes. And you should learn instinctively that there are no wrong notes. You just heard me play Round Midnight. And there were no wrong notes, right? There were also very few right notes. Very few of the notes were correct. But none of them sounded wrong. That's a state of mind. And it's best practiced in free music. And I say free music, and I don't mean free jazz. The problem is there is a joke even in free music. People try to play free music correctly. <laughs> you see the joke? There's only one freedom in music. That is freedom from the tyranny of trying to sound good. Now, how many people here have been under that tyranny every time? Yes, right. You don't have to raise your hand, but I, I get it, yeah. I mean, so much so that your life can be ruined. I mean, I get, because e I wrote this book, I get, I get letters, you know how they say. I get emails of people whose life is ruined because they don't play the way they want to play. Now, that is completely distorted. And I'm not putting them down for it, okay, because I have issues in my life that I am also blind to. So I understand. But just think about it. A life being ruined over something as insignificant as how you play music. You know? That's a crime. That's a waste. Maybe that's a sin. Maybe that's what a sin is. Wasting your life, chasing something. And actually, it's nothing wrong with chasing something, but withholding your joy unless you catch it, that's the sin right there. If you can't play music well, then you should celebrate that. Because we are meant to be celebrated. We're not meant to be berated with criticism all the time. And if we're the ones doing the criticism, we can't play. We can't relax. Now, some people do the exercises, and then they still have this problem, and they feel even worse. Jeez, I mean, I did meditation, and I uh, threw coins in a fountain, and I, uh, I uh, watched uh, Deepak, three Deepak Chopra videos. And I breathed deeply, and I ate only vegetarian Chinese, no MSG, and went to the gig, and I still sucked. <laughs> That's because you have to let go. And it doesn't matter if you let go of everything else. If you haven't let go of the performance itself, you have not let go. One of the great things about Monk is that he must have let go of his entire career. 
And that's what was so fascinating. Someone told me a story. I don't know if it's true or not, but let's never let get the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> they said that Monk was in the Vanguard one night, and uh, the band was supposed to play, and he was already an hour too late, and Max was freaking out, Max Gordon. And he came in, they started one of his tunes, and he played the intro, the first four bars of the tune, and then he played it again. And then he played it, this is already, he's two hours late. And he played it again, and again, and again. So the band looked at each other, you know, and said, well, let's start the tune, then maybe Monk will go on. So they played the tune, and Monk continued to play the first four bars <laughs> against the rest of the tune, which must have sounded brilliant. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I, I would have been screaming, it would have been so exciting. I mean, don't you just get bored with order? I mean, if not for any other reason, don't you just get bored to tears with order? You know, that's what, that's what drives innovation. So anyway, who knows what was going on in Monk's mind. Finally, the band stopped, and Monk is still playing the four bars over and over again. This is after he's two hours late. I, 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 I salute the fact that he had the, the guts to be two hours late. I mean, there's no musicians that will allow themselves to be two hours late anymore, unless they're still alive from that era. Everything's on time. What a drag. So finally, uh, Nika, the Baroness Nika, you know, of Nika's dream, that, the one that, you know, was the sort of patron saint of a few musicians, comes over and taps him on the shoulder, and he goes, ah, like that. And she goes, come on, Monk, let's get out of here. He goes, oh, okay. And he gets up, <laughs> and he walks out, and that's the end of the night. You know, I'd rather pay to see that. I swear I would. Or the night that Charlie Mingus had Carnegie Hall, and he didn't like the way it was going, so he stopped and had a rehearsal. And the people sat there till 1 o'clock in the morning. Then he continued the music. He actually punched somebody out on stage because they weren't playing the music. This is Carnegie Hall. Most people left, but a few people stayed. And they said at 1 o'clock or 1.30 in the morning, they had a hell of a concert. I don't know what the union did with that because, you know, if you go past, now if you go past 10 o'clock at Carnegie Hall, I mean, you have to pay, you know, another $50,000 in, 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 in union fees. So I don't know how he managed to do that. But these are the things that make the jazz musician legendary. But you see, you can't fake that stuff, nor is in that kind of unrest necessarily how it comes out. It could just come out in the sound of a single note. And knowing that that note is free of the constraints, of intellectual constraints, of what's appropriate. You know, the, the minute jazz became a, what's appropriate, that was, you know, it's just like, when jazz became jazz appropriate, you know, that's like Indians' holy lands that you go back there now and there's a McDonald's and a gas station, you know? That's how criminal it is. So the word jazz goes into the archives, becomes another institution, but the muse goes somewhere else. It always does. The muse does not survive very well institutions. So it busts out and looks for fresh, fresh, you know, experiences. And that's how music evolves, you know. And the challenge is staying completely spontaneous on the right side of your brain and completely loving what you do. Because if you don't accept what you do, then forget about them criticizing it. You filtered out all the great stuff before they could even criticize it. The important thing is that you get it out there without criticism, you know. That's what greases the wheels of this stuff. And then, but here's the thing, people that are like that rarely have the patience to practice little things. You know, there's always been two camps intellectually. Those people that are so creative that they can't focus on the very nerdy, uninspiring aspect of practicing. And those people that are so good at doing their homework, but they never have anything to say when they play music. You know those two camps? You know, the one guy in a school, the guy that's too creative, you know, he, he wears the same shirt for like half the semester and like never shaves, never beard. He always looks like he just, you know, came home an hour before he had to go to class. And, and he doesn't, and he sits there with his hand on his head on the class, you know. And then there's a the guy that really does his homework and he's wearing, you know, nice, out, you know, sweater and shirt. And he's got a little briefcase and he walks around and, you know, and they're like unrelated to each other. And what I'm suggesting is not abandoning either one of those parts of yourself. Spending all your time developing focus so you can practice something like you put a specimen under a microscope. That's the way you practice a single example of rhythm, harmony, and melody. You master it, you remove it, you replace it with something else, and you do it 
like brushing your teeth. Then you go and play, and as Charlie Parker is reported to have said, you forget all that shit and play. And that is the proper balance in the mind. That's how you make a virtuoso and an inspiring presence. Too often the inspiring presence has no training at all, and the virtuoso has no soul. You ever notice that in players? In that, that that's what's missing from the virtuoso, and how to really hear deep soul, you have to hear some simple music. Making you think that it's folk music itself is the soulful stuff. Jazz, or even the most complex music, 84 part counterpoint can be soulful, if the musician is in total control of that counterpoint, and they still answer to that presence inside them. It's really great to say, I'd rather receive the music from that place than have a good performance. That's a very mature point of view. Most people are not ready for that. They would say, I want to receive music from that presence, and then in parentheses, and it's going to make me sound great, you know, because then I'm going to sound so wonderful. You know, as long as you're worried about that, you can't really receive anything. You are asked to sacrifice your most prized possession, your need to sound good, and just trust. And then on the other side of it, you practice with the regular, it's uninspiring action, but it's kind of fun to focus. You know, it's great. The one thing I love about practicing is if I am practicing, I'm not aware of anything else. And in a world like this, that's, that alone is a gift. So uh, maybe I'll play another tune.
Thank you. Yeah, I like to get really, really simple and harmonic, and then I like to get really edgy. I just like the whole flavor of it. They're just flavors, you know. And styles are so, such broad descriptions that it's hard to feel the flow. To me, it's just like, what is that? Photoshop or something. When you want to, the matrix of, of colors, you move the slider thing over, it moves from a little purple into pink and then into white. I mean, you can flow so effortlessly from, from one color to another when you just accept and receive the notes. One of the ways I do that is with exercises that I actually had in my book. And I'm not going to get too academic here because it is a nightclub. <laughs> and we're going to do a bunch of clinics at uh, NYU where we can get much more nerdy and at academic. But um, I do do an exercise that's sort of a meditation at the instrument. And when I do this exercise, I open my ears and imagine that they've been thirsty throats in the desert for two weeks with the hot sun and then the music is like a cool glass of water and how hungrily and greedily would the ears lap it up if they were that thirsty and by opening the channel of the ears that's one of the things that gets this music off the ground but I'll just demonstrate this exercise it, the first step is what I call it and it's just dropping fingers and as you drop the fingers you put yourself in another state of mind as if you weren't doing it Man, that's got to be the quietest audience I've ever. And they're going to start every performance like that from now on. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> wow. You know, I want to talk about that first. Did you notice the difference in your state when I did that exercise? That puts across a very valuable thing that I need to mention. The music is powered not by the music, by the musician. It's the power of the musician to go into a state of creativity, or in that case, space, that rubs off on the audience. When the musician gets the sound to start to vibrate in their chest, in their soul, in their heart, whatever, then the audience's stomachs start to vibrate. Just like when one dog barks on a street, they all bark. When one soul starts to bark, they all bark. And so the state of the musician is created and, and, th and then transmitted, and the audience picks up that state. That's why it's important to be a real human being, not just a musician. It's important to go into a state where you are experiencing the sound, not just a, well, this is jazz. Now, either you get it or you're not educated enough. You know, I reject the notion that an audience doesn't get it because they're not educated enough. When an audience doesn't get it, it's always the performer's fault. That's my feeling. Because the performer is not giving themselves enough to the music so that the people can rise above the technology, the, what kind of music it is. That doesn't matter. 
the reason they like ska and they go to a ska concert easier than they go to a jazz concert is because maybe the people that are playing ska have not been so destroyed by education that they still feel the music. You know? And the jazz musician, where education was such a necessity, because it's such a highly technical music, maybe they're not really radiating that humanity. But the few in jazz that do, they're popular. I mean, even I've never been the beneficiary of any media support, but I have an audience. I'm one of the few 50 plus year old guys that doesn't teach in a university. I'm still playing for people because I try to touch myself. It's not about, less and less about the music. It's more and more about what little corner inside of me that I haven't been expressing because I thought it wasn't appropriate for jazz. You know? And I said, wait a minute, that's where my stuff is. So it becomes a journey into your own self and the sound of it comes out in even a single note. And this music can be profound, but only when it's played in a profound state. You know? It's not profound just because you're burning. You know, burning is like, burning is a term for those, any non-musicians here. Burning is the term for playing extremely powerfully. Burning. It's like the term shit. This is an all-purpose musical term. It refers to any noun. Any noun can be replaced by the word shit in jazz. That was some great shit you played. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and burning is the word that applies to playing with extreme power. You know, but now everybody burns. If you think that just the fact that you play well is gonna make you stand out, you know what? Education has worked, everybody plays well, everybody plays great. There's so many great playing jazz musicians today that we don't even need anymore. So whoever you stu whoever's studying, you can stop right now. <laughs> There's so many jazz musicians, it's, it's like coat hangers. Well, you look in your closet, you always have enough coat hangers, right? Did you ever buy a coat hanger? <laughs> no, they're just there. <laughs> How'd they get there? Who knows? But they're always there. There's always just enough, isn't there? Plus one. How did they get there? But there's always enough. The same thing is true about good playing jazz musicians. We don't need you. Quit now and save your parents $120,000 to $150,000. Or the, or the state. Personally, I'd rather my money go to garbage collection. But what we need is profound presences. We need people who feel themselves, who get lost in the music, get lost in the sound, and as they transform into vibration, the audience is transformed into vibration. Boy, do we need that. We need that more than ever. In a world that is completely defined by, you know, here we are numb with 24-hour media all around our room, the, the television, the computer, the radio, the CD player, the MP3 player, and we're all numb. We're in a technological, uh, you know, revolution masking dark ages for actual, for humanity, masking it with technological miracles. The fact is we don't think, we don't feel, we don't come from inside because there's so much noise out there telling us how to think, how to vote, how to have sex, who to have sex with, who not to have sex with, what to eat, keeping us hungry, horny, 24 hours a day. Although I think I was hungry and horny before I ever saw a television. But, <laughs> but definitely nurturing it, at least. You know? And what happens is the inner self gets dead. We don't know what's going on. We have no original thought. Even our original thoughts were fed to us. And we, didn't even, we forgot that it was someone else's thought. So this technological marvelous period masks a very dark age in terms of human individuality and thought. And so when a human comes up here, here, you know, they don't follow the media stereotype, you know? For example, in, in the movies, a jazz performance is always eight bars long. That's it. Watch, it comes into a restaurant and the band's burned for about eight bars, then the music gets very quiet. And it's about this conversation at the table over here, right? That's why people come into a restaurant and they listen for approximately eight bars. And then they start talking. 
because every movie they ever saw, the music only was relevant for eight bars. Then somehow they managed to turn everybody down, even the acoustic instruments, so that you could hear this conversation. You know? That, you know, so someone comes up, they don't follow the media stereotype. They're not young. In other words, they're not young, you know? Because today, you can get a record contract if you're just young enough. You don't have to have anything to say whatsoever. You just have to be young. I mean, I, I, I heard the other day, did you hear that, that they signed an embryo? <laughs> did you hear that? Verve signed an embryo. You didn't hear that, did you? You, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> no, I mean... So, you know, here, uh, someone that doesn't follow a media stereotype sits down and doesn't play in any particular style. But they feel it so deeply that you get involved in the moment and you start to vibrate with the music. The greatest compliment I've ever gotten is from people that never heard this music before and said, you know, we don't even know what that was, but we were so moved. That's what musicians have to start to think about again in addition to their practicing. What moves people, the answer is what moves you. And you have to connect the sound to it. And when we do that, we could almost become relevant again. I mean, we're relevant because we play live. And anybody that walks into a live concert, they could be changed by the live concert. It's different than watching it on television or in some media or listening to it on a CD. And if that musician is so in touch with themselves, then the people get in touch with themselves. And they might go home, for example, after a concert, so moved by the vibration that they don't turn on Leno when they get home. Could you imagine if you did concerts and it caused people not to turn on Leno when they get home? God, you would probably be killed. <laughs> some, you would meet some sort of a, you know, accidental end. You know? and it, well, nobody would be able to detect a trace in your bloodstream or anything, but sure enough, you would just be gone. If you prevented people from watching Leno when they get home, you would be rubbed out. You would be eliminated. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. The most, the most uh, much of a, of a radical you could be is to watch Letterman instead of Leno. That's it. That's as far as it goes. So imagine if your concerts cause people not to turn on a television set. Oh my God. You would not be here. But I feel like a revolutionary when I play because I'm going to go into a space that I don't define and I'm going to love it. And I think that's what makes the performance uh, important. And people get something more than, oh, I went to hear some jazz. What does that mean? I go to hear people, what they have to say. Someone says, yeah, come here, my band, we're playing ska. I said, well, you haven't told me anything yet. You know, I don't know anything about it except this... this the, the most shallow thing. Judging a music by a style is like judging a person by the clothes they're wearing. That's about where it's at. I want to hear the person and what's happening inside them. And can they transform me for an hour or two out of this media din and take me into my heart? You know? So that's just a thought of a motivation for musicians because there are some young musicians here. I think I shall play a little more music. Or does anybody have a question that one I could a do a short answer to? Yes. Hopefully it's short. Um, I think you, you talked about this in the book, but can you speak just a little bit about this idea that plagues us of the mountain of things that we have to learn? And it's, all, it's always so much and not being able to see that kind of Yeah, let me just hit that quickly. Um, one of the reasons we have problem practicing is because the, the question that creates a uh, great anxiety is, what should I practice? What should I practice first? There's so much. Does that resonate with some of you guys? There's so much to practice. Where do I start? What do I do? You know? And the answer for me is that it caused me not to be able to practice. When I faced that question, I would just turn the other way. I never could practice, and I thought I was lazy. But I wasn't lazy. I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed because I looked at all this stuff to, you know, and where do you start? And whatever you do, it's going to be a drop in the bucket, isn't it? It's not, it's not, you know, there's so much to do. What could you do that would have any, any effect? So I had to go to a uh, system where I'm only practicing. I cut down when I'm practicing until I don't feel the anxiety anymore. And then I start from there. And even the anxiety can come in terms of minutes. How long should you practice? Two hours 
people resonate with that number, but if they didn't practice for three days, then they might think they have to practice six hours. Problem is, how often do you have six hours in a day? Or even two hours? So many days that go by that you couldn't practice, what if you practiced five minutes? I think of five minutes, so I could do that anytime. I could do that while the water's boiling, you know, making my coffee. I could, and to practice five minutes, you have to have one specific thing in mind. If you work on that with a clear mind for five minutes, you get better than if you ramble for two hours and you're practicing. The way I learned this is that I was in school a straight D minus student. I really was. I had D to D minuses in everything I ever did. And in fact, some guys passed me only because I played piano good. Like, for example, I flunked algebra three times, but they, they put me through because they said, well, it's all right, you're going to be a musician anyway, you know. They always said, we'll see you in Carnegie Hall. They kind of screwed me up with that one. But it doesn't matter because you play so great, we're going to pass you anyway. But, but either I failed or I was a D-minus student. And I used to bring these books home every day. And I looked at the stack of books and I go, all right, I'm going to start, maybe I'll have some milk and cookies first. Then I'll go back up and, oh, well, there's the books. Mm, I think I'll watch a half hour of television. And then I'll, you know, and now I'm going to practice right after dinner. And then I, you know, and then I got to make a few phone calls. But right after those phone calls, I'm going to practice. Anybody go through this? You know, you put everything in front of practicing because you're not ready for the enormity of what you think that has to be. But if you break it down to a point where you feel like you can do it any time, like five minutes, then you could have practiced 20 times in the day for five minutes. And if you broke down what you had to practice to one thing or another, it's not that those other things don't exist. But when you're working on one thing, it's really important not to lift your eyes. So one year in school, a teacher was not impressed with my piano playing, and he did flunk me in a science class. And I had to suffer the indignity of going to summer school. I don't know how it is these days. I think parents send their kids to summer school because they want them to all come off as geniuses on their SATs or something. Nobody can have an ordinary kid anymore. Did you ever notice that? Everybody's kid is so special. And I say that as one who has a very special daughter. <laughs> I'm thinking, except my kid. But, but I had to go to summer school. It was so humiliating. It was the best summer of my life. For the first summer in my whole life, I had to get dressed every day. I mean, I usually found a pair of shorts around late June, and we washed them the 1st of September. <laughs> you know, I used to sit in my den, watch the baseball game, sitting next to the air conditioner. That was my summer. I was the only kid that came back paler than when he, went, when he went on vacation. But this summer, I had to get dressed and go out every day. And you know what? I only had one book in my hand. And when I came home, I couldn't wait to do my homework because I knew it was only one book. The idea that I had cut it down, I'm so glad you asked me because it wouldn't have been part of this clinic, but it would have been part of another because we're doing a bunch of them this month for this. You see what cameras we're doing, doing, trying to do a DVD of this stuff so people can entertain themselves with that. Nothing like more media, right? Um, I did my homework. I actually did really well because it was only one book, one subject. I found out I'm not lazy. It's just so overwhelming. Music is a lot like that. There's so many things you can be practicing. If you can narrow it down, and while you're working on it, while you're working on it, nothing else exists in your vision. You know it's out there, but think about it. If you work on something and you rush through it because you know there's so much else I've got to do, and you skim the surface and your playing doesn't change, how is it going to be better to go on to the next subject? We gauge our progress by how many subjects we covered. That's not it. It's how deeply we cut into one issue before moving on to the next. That actually changes our playing. I could practice for five minute packets and change my playing. And I could cover everything and never change my playing. You all know what I'm talking about. You're practicing a million things. You're not getting any better. It would be better to work on one issue and, f and master it. See, when you're working on one thing, you, you learn, you master it. And what do I mean by master? Mastery is the effortless execution of. You could do it in your sleep. You could do it and talk, you know. It's like I said in the book, the example of using a fork. You've used a fork 100,000 times. Do you ever miss your mouth? Right? Well, maybe seven times. <laughs> and you were a little stoned. So seven out of 100,000 is still not bad. I mean, how many times did you lose the time? Or lose one? What we say in music, lose one. And turn the beat around. Mm. Mm. How many people lose one here? Sometimes. Raise your hand. Oh, <laughs> that's great. All right, I just saw two people raise their hand. One guy went like this. 
just with a finger. The other guy went. He noticed no one else raised their hand. All right now, how many people lose one if they didn't raise their hand the first time? Okay, now a little more courage there, just because I said that other stuff. I mean, it's so hard to admit that, right? See, this is the illusion of music. How many people masturbate? Oh, all right, you're embarrassed about that too. Most of the time when I do that, people raise their hand, they rather admit in public that they masturbate <laughs> than that they, they lose one. <laughs> That's how powerful the illusion is. You know? But, so you take one practice. Mastery means you could be having sex, doing your taxes, and talking on the phone, and you can still do this thing. You know? Now you want to make rhythm, harmony, and melody that. You don't want to be rhythmic once in a while when the piano's good, when the drummer doesn't play any funny shit, when the sound system is not working well. If you had a cold last night, none of these things are reasons that you mess up the time. You only mess up things that you haven't mastered. And that's how you know they still need more practice. Now that you can't fix it all at once, but you can go so deeply into one subject. In other words, if your rhythm's not good, I would practice one rhythm after another against time or whatever you're choosing, a, you know, metronome or a beat or whatever, and take each rhythm that was difficult and work it until, and we're not going to get into how to work it, but that's in my book too, The Fourth Step, uh, uh, another time, another place, you know. But work it until that rhythm, it was difficult this morning, is easy by nightfall or by the next night. If I start tomorrow practicing, I don't, I don't go out of focus and say, what was I practicing yesterday? That rhythm. Is it finished? You put your hand down? No, it's not. So you're still practicing that. As long as you keep your eye on one thing, you can, for whatever, five minutes, a minute, or an hour, you can always go right back to practicing. But when you try to conceive of the whole thing, it becomes like this glass globe. And you're looking in from the outside. And you can never get in to be the kind of player that you really want to be. It's better to get in with one su subject. Practice it from the point of unfamiliarity to complete control or mastery, or at least familiarity. Then move on to another thing. If you keep doing that, you will grow from every exercise. You'll actually hear change in your playing tonight if you practice that way this morning. But if you keep skimming the subjects, you won't hear any change. And, and if you're like me, you won't even practice. I could not practice until I learned this lesson. You know? So I think I have to wrap up almost here, just because of the, the time. So I think I'll finish with a piece. We'll play, uh, right.
Thanks very much. Thanks for coming out. Thank you.